All right, I'd like to start off with our confession because I believe it's very important. You know, I'm kind of a repetitive teacher in some aspects because I believe with repetition, uh, it sticks with people better and uh, people will kind of commit things to memory and commit things to heart. All right, so our confession, as we've been saying every time that I speak, uh, is you can't do anything to earn the love of God, nor can you do anything that bad to ever lose the love of God. He loves you just because that's what he chooses to do. And therefore, you can serve him without pressure to perform. However, because God loves us so authentically, our grateful response should be to live a life that reflects our creator's nature and character. I'm going to read that one more time. <clears throat> I'll generally be opening up with this every time that I speak and preach. You can't do anything to earn the love of God, nor can you do anything that bad to ever lose the love of God. He loves you just because that's what he chooses to do. And therefore, you can serve him without pressure to perform. However, because God loves us so authentically, our grateful response should be to live a life that reflects our creator's nature and character. All right, we've been talking about that as well, uh, about how the way to demonstrate our love to God is through our lifestyle, our way of living, and making sure that uh, all parts of our life matches the nature and the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because you should look like the one that you serve. Uh, but then Jesus did rebuke some folks in the Bible and told them, he said, uh, your daddy is the devil, because ain't no truth in him, he a liar, ain't nothing good about him. So he didn't hesitate. See, when people say be like Jesus, they think you're supposed to just hold your tongue and be meek and mild and turn the other cheek. No, Jesus knew when to turn it up. He said, your daddy is the devil. All right. And I always say our lifestyle will indicate uh, who it is that we serve. All right. Because oftentimes our uh, actions, our behavior, our character, our nature uh, betrays us because out of our mouth we bless God, but our life says something else. And so in order to be very impacting and impactful for the kingdom of God, we have to make sure that our, our words and our actions line up, that there is some synergy and some connectedness with our words. All right. So listen, we're, as I said, I don't know what part we own, but we're going to continue uh, with the lifestyle of obedience. I do believe uh, Minister Erneed taught last Tuesday and uh, she did a wonderful job picking back up and kind of tying that in uh, with life stewardship principles all right so now in order to be a good steward and i'll start it off like this in order to be a good steward over your life in any aspect this requires one to receive and apply the wisdom of god as found in the word of god so in other words if you are, if you are going to be a good steward over your life this requires obedience you know for you to be uh, cognizant or aware of what the Word of God requires and what it says and that you obey it because without the help of God uh, listen there, there's no way ultimately that we can be good stewards and so we want to make sure that listen if we're, we're, we're claiming to be good stewards and we're purposed to be good stewards and we know uh, we have to have our roots in being obedient to the Word of God utilizing His wisdom the principles the precepts the commands and all of that that God lays out in his word that helps us to be good stewards. All right. You can't be disobedient and a good steward at the same time as it concerns the born again believer. We're talking about uh, the body of Christ right now. You can't be disobedient and a good steward at the same time. Those kind of contradict. All right. There are several scriptures where Jesus implies that obedience is directly. I want you to type that word in the comments directly. See, we'd be trying to indirectly apply stuff. Jesus speaks very direct in a lot of cases. And it's usually in a stern, hard manner. Doesn't leave his foundation of love, but he speaks in a stern, hard manner. Uh, but there are several scriptures where Jesus implies that obedience is directly connected to being in a solid relationship with him. Type that word in the comments. Directly. Directly. All right? To want us to know that the word of God speaks to us directly. All right. I don't believe in indirect. And that one should not proclaim him as his as their savior. If their lifestyle is one of disobedience. 
I'll say that again and I'll read the whole thing. There are several scriptures where Jesus implies that obedience is directly connected to being in a solid relationship with him. And that, should, and that one a person should not proclaim him as their savior if their lifestyle is one of disobedience. And so again, this drives back the simple point that you cannot acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and personal savior and yet live a lifestyle of disobedience. We're not talking about faults and flaws and those things that, uh, you know, may befall us sometimes where we may waver off track. And even check this out. <clears throat> Y'all know what I always say, but I want to remind us because I haven't said this in a while. <clears throat> the Bible does say all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God, but it never says you're allowed to sin and fall short of the glory of God. It, it, it doesn't say that. So, so don't think just because you fall short and the reality of God's grace that he gives you permission to fall short because God never gives nobody. I don't. Can anybody find a scripture where, where God says, uh, anybody, if you can... And uh, Pastor Francis, if you can jump on Facebook for me and engage that audience. Good evening, Facebook family. Thank you all for tuning in as well and to our primary audience here on Zoom. Uh, can y'all find a scripture anywhere where Jesus says, uh, you're human, you're flesh and blood, so it's okay to sin sometimes. We know uh, ain't nobody perfect. We, I, I know your heart and I know you try. Anybody, anybody find one of those scriptures where he gives us uh, permission just because we're quote unquote human, uh, permission to sin, permission to fall short? If y'all do find one, make sure you give it to me, all right? Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's not there. So again, we have to remember that Jesus demands obedience under any and all circumstances. One of the things I want to keep driving home to us is this. We can learn a lot of principles, a lot of lessons in life from many Bible characters. Moses, Solomon, Samson, David, uh, Esther, Ruth, and the list goes on. Uh, the Apostle Paul, Peter. But listen, we should not be pattering our life after David, Peter, Moses, Elijah, nobody else. The only Bible character that we should be pattering our life after is Jesus. And Jesus taught us what it means to have unwavering uh, obedience to the Father. Jesus never wavered from his foundation of obedience to the Father. That what I what I see my father do, that's what I do. I come to work the works of him that sent me. He was sent to this earth by God. He is God in flesh. Uh, but then when he came to uh, came to the earth, then God assumed the role of father and Jesus became son. He said, listen, I come to do what I was sent to do. And he never, he was tempted because the Bible says that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmity, meaning uh, he was tempted in all aspects as we were because that's what the scripture goes on to say. But it says, yet without sin. And so this is why it come to help us to realize that, listen, being human uh, and, 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 and battling this flesh does not give you permission to fall short, to be, uh, it says we will fall short, but it doesn't say we're allowed to. Because if Jesus is our model and we're pattering our life after him, then we need to understand that we have the opportunity and the ability to have, to demonstrate and display unwavering obedience to the will the will and the word of God. Why? Because if we say Jesus is our Lord and personal Savior and that's the one we're trying to be like, we need to pattern in our life. Whenever people want to justify their sin, this goes for us all. Again, we will fall short, but it doesn't mean we're allowed to fall short. Jesus didn't die on the cross uh, so that we can have victory over sin, victory over temptation some of the time, 20% of the time, 70% of the time. Jesus died so that we can have victory uh, and conquer sin and temptation 100% of the time, right? And he modeled that. And so I don't want us to let ourselves off the hook, you know, by thinking I'm just human. You know, God knows I'm going to fall short. You don't have to. You know, it, it, what we love the most, that's what we're going to give the most attention to. And what you love the most, you're going to feed it and it's going to continue to grow. So it, it, if you love your carnal nature, you're going to feed uh, your carnal nature and your carnal nature opposes that which God stands for and the more you feed your carnal nature nature give your flesh what it desires and all of that type of stuff then guess what you will find it hard to to stick in the word of God to stay rooted and grounded on the word of God and to have your life pat be patterned after the life that we see Jesus living through the holy scriptures but I want us to know it is very possible to have 100% victory over every bout with sin over every temptation. 
Whether you do or not is up to you and your walk with Christ. But don't use your humanity as an excuse for why you fall short. Because Jesus was 100% human, right? And 100% divine, right? So he still, he, he hurt like we do. Listen, he had to sleep like we do. He cried and grieved like we do. You know, he had to, uh, he had to walk like we did. He had a job, all that type of stuff, right? He, he did regular preaching like I'm doing right now. Right. He, so, so, so we have to remember, we can't use humanity as an excuse for why we fail to be obedient to God. All right. Now, in John 14, 15, some of these scriptures uh, are kind of repetitive, but I believe, uh, again, in being repetitive in some ways because people still don't get it. So I just believe some things just needs to be repeated uh, because hopefully it will begin to just stick with you and we can begin to really live this out. But in John 14, 15, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. If someone here on Zoom uh, can make sure you put those scriptures in the comments. Brother Eddie would do that for us on tonight. Thank you. And for those that uh, are on Facebook Live, Pastor Francis uh, will put the scriptures in the comments there. John chapter 14, verse 15, English Standard Version. Again, every scripture I give tonight is going to be English Standard Version. So I'm not going to repeat English Standard Version again. All right? But it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, this inadvertently says this. If you don't keep my commandments, then you don't love me. All right? That, that, that's the flip side of what Jesus is saying. The scripture actually says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. This is not Pastor Matt talking. Uh, Jesus didn't say, try to keep my commands. Do your best. Strive. Work your hardest to keep my commandments. He just simply says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And again, this inadvertently says, if you don't keep my commandments, then you don't love me. Now, but we do need to kind of ask ourselves, what commandments are, is Jesus referring to? Because he, he also tells us that his commandments, his requirements are not burdensome. They're not grievous. All right. So it's not like a taskmaster putting burdens on our shoulders like the Pharisees and the Sadducees would do to people to try to keep the law. No, no. He said, my commandments, my laws are not burdensome. All right. But what commandments is Jesus referring to when he talks about if you love me, you'll keep them in John 14, 15. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Which says, and he, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said... All the law and the prophets, every, every law of Moses, all, including the Ten Commandments, he said, listen, can be summed up with love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, all that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because when you even go back and look at the Ten Commandments, some of those dealt with our vertical relationship and others dealt with our horizontal relationship, meaning, you know, God knew that, you know, back then in the Old Testament that folks needed uh, some instructions and things like that as it pertains to their horizontal relationship. I mean, a vertical relationship between man and God and our horizontal relationship between uh, us amongst one another as, as people of God. All right. When our love for God, hear this. So again, so let me put it like this. I, I want to sum up a point before I uh, transition on. I mentioned this in one of my classes. I said, so I'm technically, you know, we don't need to spend time uh, beating the Ten Commandments over people's heads because if we teach people, uh, what it means to love God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and all that type of stuff, and to love other people, including our enemies, uh, as we love ourselves, then guess what? That's going to take care of the Ten Commandments right there because when you love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, you love your neighbor as yourself, right? You won't do things to offend God. You won't do things to harm and hurt your neighbor, all right? Does that make sense? That's one of the... Uh, that's one of, especially when it comes to loving our enemies, because Jesus says, loving those that love you. He said, loving those that love you 
He said, even the hypocrites, the Pharisees, the all them jack the folk, they do that too. He said, but I'm calling my people to a higher way of living, which is why he ministered to us through the gospel to love our enemies. Bless those that curse you. You know, pray for them that despitefully use you, all that type of stuff, because he was calling us to a higher level of living. He said, you don't get kudos for loving your mother. You get kudos in the kingdom for loving the person that's trying to get you fired from your job. Uh, you get kudos from the person uh, that's been scandalizing your name all over, right? That, that's where you get kudos at in the kingdom for loving those people. Of course, you should love everybody, and this includes your family, but that goes without being said. Jesus said even hypocrites can do that, right? The religious people can do that. Th th that ain't no good. They can even love those that love them. But can you love your enemies, those that oppose you, those that come against you willfully, intentionally, all right? Now, when our love for God is pure and not a superficial, manufactured love, then we will shy away from doing things that will grieve the heart of God, which includes a lot of things, but namely, it all comes down to disobedience. When you really love God and it's pure, not the manufactured religious type love, right? Where you make folks think you're, you're at a better place in your spiritual life than you really are. But at a, when, when it's a pure thing, you're, you're going to do all you can to steer your life away from the flow of disobedience. You're going to do all you can to be obedient to God. And guess what? Again, we talk about the partnership with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to get to that as well. But you're never left alone to do this by yourself. You have to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. But you have to first make the decision to say, uh, I, I, I want to demonstrate my love for God by through my obedience. You have to make that intentional decision on a moment-by-moment, -moment, day day-by-day basis. That gives the Holy Ghost permission to come in to help you. You, you can't just... You know, throw everything on the Holy Ghost. No, you have to make the decision. The decision, part of this is discipline, you know, and self-control. And then the other part is the part that the Holy Ghost plays, his power that comes to link up with our discipline and our self-control. Y'all know why I always say, too, why we can't throw everything on the Holy Spirit? It's because it's amazing. And I, I've said this a thousand times, but I do need to repeat it so you all can get this. So you can stop just throwing yourself on the Holy Spirit. Like, no. You got a part to play in this too. Uh, how is it that folks that are not saved, Jesus is not their Lord and personal Savior. They, be, they have the best attitudes. Some of them have the best attitudes. They know how to control their tongue. They are very encouraging people. But the Holy Ghost filled ones that proclaim Christ in church all the time, speaking in tongues, falling out, always in their Bible. They mean, they gossip, they say things they shouldn't say. They, they have no joy when the cares of life come. They act like they can't deal with no pressure or pain. You get what I'm saying? And then furthermore, let's check this out. What about those people that are not saved uh, that don't believe in fornication? They not Jesus is not their Lord and personal Savior, uh, but they believe in keeping themselves. But you got saints that give themselves away and not married. How, so if everything was on the Holy Ghost, then guess what? Unbelievers would not have the ability or opportunity to live righteously. So in some ways, part of righteous living comes down to us and our decisions and our choices and having self-discipline and control. Does that make sense? I'm going somewhere with this, but I, I, so I want us to know that it is a partnership with the Holy Spirit. You know, when it comes to being obedient to God, but it does not just fall on the Holy Spirit. All right. Now. It amazes me again how so many Christians boldly profess Christ, but yet their life is rooted and grounded in doing everything that seems to oppose the nature and the word of God. Now, because Jesus says, talked about our love for God and our love for each other, our neighbors. And our love for people, including our enemies, should derive from the love we say we have for God. If you say you love God and that you're vertical relationship is well structured and stable and progressive that needs to be demonstrated by how you show your love to the people that's around you again including your enemies that's the real test of your love always remember that can you love your enemies authentically now first john 4 20 not the gospel of john first john 
1 John chapter 4, verse 20. It says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is very simple. Like how people can say, I love Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and personal Savior. But they treat other folks with contempt. They treat other folks so mean. They, they, they be bitter. They be harsh and rude, right? But yet they so proudly profess, Jesus is my Lord and personal Savior. But this person, this, this author in 1 John says, you can't say you love God who you're not seeing and hate your brother who you see every day. All right? So, so, in, so in an aspect, we'll know where you stand at in your relationship with God and your obedience uh, to his requirements based off of how you treat the people around you, especially the people that don't like you. Test of obedience truly comes in when uh, people do willfully oppose you. You know they may be saying bad things about you on the job and even other folks at the church or, you know, even in your family and things like that. People may be trying to uh, shut doors for you or get things to not happen for you or to just bad mouth you. And like I said, get you fired. God may say, uh, I, I want you to give them a gift card uh, to Macy's. I want you to give them a gift card to go out to eat and have lunch. Can you obey God during those tough moments? In, in, in fact, what, what if you've seen somebody that bad mops you so bad to everybody and, and, and probably succeeded in getting you fired, right? And you see their car broke down on the side of the road. Would you go help them? Or would you, would you give them uh, your uh, AAA benefit so that they can get their tire fixed? Those are the moments where your true test and how much you say you obey God will be put to test, right? In those inconvenient moments. See, anybody can be obedient to God when it's convenient, you get what I'm saying? But when it's inconvenience, when inconvenience is present, that's when it'll show where we really stand. Now, is it, it's a, it amazes me how some of the people, and I, I'm very careful with avoid many or most and all that type of stuff. Some of the people that preach the hardest and teach the hardest about the importance of the love of God abounding in our lives, are sometimes the main individuals that carries grudges and unforgiveness and live in bitterness against each other. It should be hard, hear this, it should be hard to preach things that has not first taken root in our lives. In fact, anyone who preaches anything that they are not sincerely striving to live out in an authentic way are considered hypocrites. And so you can't preach love if you're really not operating in love, if you're not demonstrating the love to others, all right? Especially the quote-unquote what we say, they don't deserve my love. Well, uh, we don't deserve the love of God, but he still freely gives it to us. So be careful of saying that. And I hope you're not, none of you all are one that says any of that. Uh, they don't deserve my love. They don't deserve this goodness. We don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve the blessings that he gives us. We don't deserve none of that. But yet, he still gives it to us, right? Freely. Not grudgingly, freely. So we, if we, we say Jesus is our Lord and personal Savior, then we must obey the blueprint that Jesus left for us. And the blueprint from what we know about the nature and the character of God through scriptures. I want to do a check-in. Am I making sense? This is simple teaching, but this, these are the points where people stumble in their relationship with God. We want the power of God a lot of times. We just don't want the character and the nature of God. That's the problem. Everybody want to work signs, wonders, and miracles. Nobody want to love like Jesus loved, right? Nobody want to... Uh, want to have the nature or his character. Nobody want to develop the fruit of the spirit as we ought to have, according to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. But we want to prophesy. We want to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. No. Fruit of the spirit is more important than the spiritual gifts, right? Because remember what I always say, the fruit of the spirit proves that you are really connected to Christ. The, and they work together, but fruit of the spirit is more important than the spiritual gifts, right? Because Jesus says, listen, you can have the spiritual gifts, prophecy, the working of miracles, tongues, and the gift of faith, and healings, and all of that type of stuff, and still go to hell. 
How do we know that? Because he said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name? Did we cast out demons in your name? Did we work miracles in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. Why? Because we were trying to operate in the power of God, but we didn't have his character, the nature, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. Jesus says you'll know a tree by the fruit it bear. Get what I'm saying? The second scripture where Jesus challenges us to live in the manner that proves he is Lord over our life rather than just merely saying the words is found in Luke chapter 6 verse 46. Luke chapter 6 verse 46. Luke chapter 6 verse 46. It said, Jesus asked a simple question here. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do what I tell you to do. I'm going to ask that question again. And this is for us. Even though he had an intended audience. This rings true for us. And we should ask ourselves this. Why do we call Jesus Lord, Lord. And don't do what he tell us to do. In many instances. Our words tend to not carry weight. When our lifestyle does not flow in sync with those words. How can we evangelize or be a light to a dark world as believers if we are too living in darkness like those we are trying to reach? See, you can't be in darkness and reach those in darkness at the same time. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and then I will receive you. Right? So if, you, if you're honest, see, the thing is, people, and they erroneously use this. Well, Jesus was around the tax collectors. Jesus was around the sinners. Jesus was around the messed up people. Yeah, but he didn't become them. Some Christians are getting around circles of people and becoming the people that they are trying to reach. You can't become a crackhead and reach a crackhead at the same time. You, 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 you can't. Uh, start hop, bed hopping and, and, and try to reach those that God has called you to that are currently bed hopping, right? You, you have to remain, this lifestyle remain clean. It, it requires cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness. And y'all know what I usually say, holiness is still right. We have to obey the call for holiness. It is possible, you all, for all of us. I told you that. I'm going to keep driving this home. Jesus didn't die so we can have victory sometimes. He died so we can got up from the grave as well, so we can have victory all the time. Put that, I can have victory all the time. All the time. I can have victory all the time. Keep that in your mind before you start consoling yourself of why you fell short. I fall short because, you know, uh, ain't nobody perfect. You know, this guy still doing some stuff in me. Uh, yeah, but while he's doing things in you, he still calls us to grow and mature at the same time. Now, as I always reassure us of, no one will be perfect in a flawless sense. Okay? However, write this scripture in your notes. Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. This is very important. So, because the Bible does tell us in Matthew 5 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, when we hear the word perfect, our connotation because of society and just regular lingo means flawless, but that's not the Bible's intent behind the word perfect in Matthew 5, 48. It says, be perfect as your father, your heavenly father is perfect. The word perfect in this passage is important that we break this down so that you will understand. The word perfect in this passage comes from the Greek word teleos, T like time, E-L-E. I O S T E L E I O S Telios, which means mature and fully developed. So that's what perfection, when it said be spiritually mature, grow spiritually, become spiritually mature, right? That's the connotation that 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 the scripture gives us when it comes when it comes to being uh perfect or called to be perfect. Now and therefore, as we commit ourselves to intentional spiritual growth and maturity, hear that. Y'all hear that word? Intentional. This is not going to, you're not going to grow spiritually and mature through osmosis. As we become more intentional 
with regards to our spiritual growth and maturity, the desire to live sinful lives on all levels should decrease. As you're growing and maturing in God, the things that currently hinders you should not be hindering you time down the road, right? Ten years down the road, you're still struggling with what you struggled with when you first got saved, right? Some, that be us. Because sometimes we, we say, well, this struggle is so hard. When we say that, we make our struggles more powerful than the power of God. When we persist on not being delivered from our struggles. And we got to stop using Paul's example because nobody knows what that thorn was. People use all type of sinful lifestyles and habits and addictions to say, well, Paul had a thorn. Uh, I'm sure Paul wasn't uh, addicted to cocaine. I'm sure Paul wasn't fornicating, right? Uh, so we, so uh, if scripture doesn't give us light on that, we can't use that as a leverage. And furthermore, I'm not trying to be like Paul. I'm trying to be like Jesus. Jesus walked fully delivered. There was nothing that held him back, right? So I, I'm not worried about Paul and the thorn he continued to live with. I'm Matt Johnson, right? Jesus is my Lord and personal Savior, not Paul. So therefore, I can walk without any thorns. Because when God delivers, he does the thing perfectly and fully. Does that make sense? Is this helping somebody? Now, if you want to continue to live with your thorn, uh, then you, you make Paul your Lord and personal Savior. And use that example, right? And, and furthermore, even when he said... Uh, it says it was given to him uh, as something to buffet his flesh, right, from Satan. So, so when he pleaded with the Lord to take that thorn away from him, God says, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Listen, he was telling Paul, uh, this is no excuse not to do what I called you to do, uh, but you got to deal with this, right? Certain things he's given us power to deal with, but it all comes down to understanding this. Jesus is your Lord and personal Savior. Whatever your issue is, whatever your troubles is, listen, there is a such thing as full deliverance, full healing, full wholeness. You don't have to continue to walk around bound and things like that. Okay? So again, as we commit ourselves to intentional spiritual growth and maturity, the desire to live sinful lives on all levels should decrease. As we continue to grow in God, we should lose the appetite to be disobedient. To be intentionally rebellious. We should lose the appetite for that. Check this out. Temptation will never go away. Temptation will never go away. But our desire and willingness to succumb to it should decrease more and more as we grow and mature more and more. If we continually through all seasons of our life, hear this. If we continually, through all seasons of our life, find it easy to betray the word of God and the will of God through our words and actions, we then have to ask ourselves, am I really a follower of Christ? This is one of those teachings that should reflect because I'm giving a scripture because Jesus is very blatant and blunt with what he says. So don't get this wrong. He, he's, he's, he's our God of grace and mercy and love, but he's very blunt in what he says. And the word of God is very clear in what it says. Now, being a Christian should spark a desire to live as Christ lived, which was in an unwavering, obedient manner to God. He never wavered. And if we're trying to be like him, we profess Christ then listen, we should try to remain as much as possible on a foundation of obedience. Why? Because that's, that's the nature and character that we see from Jesus all throughout Scripture. He never wavered away, even when he was getting beat. Listen, he fulfilled his assignment all the way to the point of death. Listen, some folks talk about us, uh, some unfortunate things happen in our money or family, and we're ready to give up on God. We're ready to stop. Oh, how can God use me? How can, I ain't going to be able to do what God called me to do because I, I do this. Number one, remember, you don't have to succumb to whatever temptations and things going on around you. But if you do, just also know that's no excuse to then become disobedient to God. Listen, some things you may have to walk through. And, and I always say, you know, your deliverance will come in time as you commit yourself, right? Uh, that you want to do right by God. And let me help us out with something. This just came to my mind. Now, when you're asking God to deliver you from something, right? Whatever the case may be. 
You can't continue to indulge in it and continue to pray for God to deliver you from it. Remember some of this, the Holy Spirit is our help, our source of power. But some of this is self-discipline and self-control. Like I can't uh, pray for God to deliver me from crack and I'm intentionally keep going to the crack house. And I know a lot of crackheads, so I've talked to a lot. So they had, I had, they, one told me, I had to make the decision to stay away from the crack house. It was hard going through withdrawals, I had to go to the hospital, all this type of stuff. But I had to make the choice to stay away from the crack house until the Holy Ghost changed my taste and my desires. You can't say, Holy Ghost, change my taste and desires. Change what I desire, those unhealthy desires, and you continue to indulge in it. No. Remember, this is a partnership, y'all. Now, uh, many people... Now, let me, let me go back because I think I'm missing something. Let me pause for one second and regain my place. Got it. If you are not growing and maturing spiritually then you have to sincerely ask yourself, why am I not growing and maturing in my spiritual life? Be honest. Some people won't be honest. I'm doing all right. I'm good. I'm, I'm getting there. Be honest. If you're not growing spiritually, you have to admit to it and then ask yourself, why am I not growing spiritually? Then you ask yourself, who's holding me back? Paul, a couple of times he says, you ran well, but who hindered you? You ran well, but who bewitched you? Then you have to ask, what's holding me, holding me back? May not be a person, could be something you're involved in. What's holding me back? Who's holding me back? Right? The problem is some people are clearly aware of what and who's holding them back from growing and maturing spiritually, but they love that what and who more than they love the God that is calling them to grow and mature. I'm going to say this again because it's true. If it hurts, just say ouch. The problem is some people, some of us, even some of you that may be listening to me, are clearly aware of who and what's holding you back from growing and maturing spiritually, but you love that what and who more than you love the God that is calling you to grow and mature. Shouldn't be like that, my friends. Many people will say that's not true or that's not fair to say. But again, hear this. How can we continue intentionally living opposite of Christ, but yet proudly declaring that we are a follower, a follower of Christ? So you can't content. Listen, again, our lifestyle, our way of living, our deeds, our actions, our behavior, our character, that, that, that should line up to God's word. That's how we demonstrate our gratitude. For we don't, we don't have no pressure to perform because remember, God loves us regardless. No matter what, you can't do nothing to lose. You can't do nothing to earn it, right? We, we've established that. But now the ball is in your court. What, what you going to do to show God that you really appreciate this grace and mercy? Continue to give him more to cover you with? Or let me give you, you love me that much, Jesus? Let me give you some more sin to cover me in. Let, 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 me, let me give you some more wickedness, and some more rebellion, some more disobedience. Uh, so you can give me some more grace. No, no, that's not how it's supposed to go, you all. Now. Another scripture, talking about Jesus and how direct he was with regards to our call to be committed to him and that be demonstrated through our lifestyle. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Drink some water. Jesus says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Type that in the comments. Keep it. Because that's what this scripture said. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. When he says keep it, that is indicative of doing the word. Obeying the word. Putting some action to the word. Alright? Now, the Greek word for blessed, when it says blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The Greek word for blessed is makarios. M like mother, A-K-A-R-I-O-S. Makarios, which means happy, fortunate, good, in a position of favor. Happy, feelings associated with receiving God's favor. That's what it means to be blessed, again. Happy, fortunate, 
good in a position of favor. Uh, feelings associated with receiving God's favor. That's indicative of what the word blessed is. So when you say I'm blessed, just know what you're saying because a lot of us don't really know what it means to be blessed. We get some money and a car and a house. We say I'm blessed. No, but it's deeper than that. We are always in a battle that involves our spirit, which is always willing to please God, and our flesh, our carnal, sinful human nature, which is always in opposition to God. That battle is never going nowhere. As long as you're in this flesh, there's always going to be a battle between the flesh that wants to do opposite of what God called us to do, and your spirit, which is always, because the Bible said the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? So that battle ain't never going nowhere, no matter how safe you get. You just are responsible for continuing to win that battle in your everyday life, right? But we've already received the victory. We just got to walk this victory out. We received the power to exercise and exert victory over temptations, over those daily sinful opportunities that we have, right? But we just got to exercise that with good decisions and choices, not playing with fire, all right? And so the enemy uses our natural lusts and unhealthy desires and tries to paint a picture that being free to indulge in sinful, carnal things is what brings our life extreme pleasure and happiness. The devil always wants to say that. that that'll make you happy. Like, you know, God just don't want you to have no fun. He, he, he don't want you to be free, Right? And he tries to paint this picture that being free means I'm going to let my desires, I'm going to let my proclivities run wild, have whatever looks good to me, have whatever feels good to me, have whatever good, whatever tastes good to me. That's the picture the devil tries to paint, right? But when we live unrestricted according to our carnal nature, this actually makes us slaves to unrighteousness. And it comes with the price that none of us none of us are honestly able to pay. See, none of us see the wayward way, the downside, I should say, of pleasing our flesh. What pleasing our flesh does, always going after what looks good, what feels good, what tastes good, until the consequences come. Then it's like, oh Lord, no, 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 don't cry now. Take whatever comes along with, because it wasn't no oh Lord when you were enjoying the stuff that pleased your flesh, right? But it, and that puzzles me too, you know. Uh, I can honestly say that's never been my nature even since I was a child. Like, you know, I'm told not to do something, not to do it. When the consequences come, I take it and continue on. You know, I get myself back on the right path, but I don't go crying. Oh, Lord, help. Like that. Y'all know that you gave that testimony when Pastor Johnson went to jail 18 years ago. Listen, and I knew I was still the one supposed to be doing that stuff I was doing. I was working at Burlington Co. Factory back in 04. Uh, but when them cops came and got me in that store, I didn't call mom. Oh, give me some bail money. I'm scared. None of that. I took it like a G. So, so if you're going to be big and bad enough to disobey God and live a life of disobedience, right? To live a life of rebellion, then guess what? Be big and bad enough to accept the consequences and things that come along with doing so. That's the point I'm making. Now, God's love is real. God's grace is real. God's mercy is real. But guess what? The consequences of living a carnal, sinful life are real too. And God's love, grace, and mercy is still real even when we have to reap those consequences. So don't think God's grace and mercy is always going to get you out uh, from eating the fruit of your own ways, right? Uh, so when you do things, you know, naturally there's a consequence to it. You can ask for forgiveness. You can repent. That's fine. God won't hold that against you. He's going to, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He got you, but you're still going to have to eat the fruit of your own ways. You're still going to have to walk out those consequences of that sin, of that disobedience, all right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He says, but I, Paul, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let me read that again for clarity's sake. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. 
But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Hear this. The Apostle Paul saw the necessity of not letting, not letting. All right. Very important. I put that phrase there. Not letting his carnal, sinful human nature run rampant because it has the opportunity to kill you spiritually. When you let your carnal, sinful human nature, your proclivities, proclivities run wild, it will kill you spiritually. And guess what? In some cases, it will kill you in the natural too. All right? Some things, people pay the price with their life. You know, you know that, right? Don't think everything is just this metaphorical, or oh, you're going to die spiritually, you're going to have some mental and emotional trauma. No. Be careful what you get into. I don't ever make people feel it's okay to make no mistakes. And I don't live my life that way. I don't, especially in youth, I don't tell you, oh, get your mistakes out now, you got time. No, you don't. Because you make the wrong mistake, it can take you out. Right? So we have to be careful by uh, being easy on ourselves. It was just a mistake because if you make the wrong mistake or the right one, I should say, it may take you out. So this is why you always want to be cognizant of trying to lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledging the Lord, and he will direct your paths, obeying that. Now, and so although the Holy Spirit is our help, I'm going to keep getting that across to us, is our help. Paul didn't say, the Holy Spirit disciplines his body, did he? He said, I discipline my body. Now, it wasn't too many people apart from Jesus that was full of the Holy Spirit like Paul was, right? But, but, but he didn't say, uh, but the Holy Spirit disciplines my body. He said, no, I discipline my body. Right? Remember, the Holy Spirit is our partner, not our do life for us. Let me read. Let me read that again. The Holy Spirit is our partner, not our do life for us. The Holy Spirit is not supposed to be doing life for you. You do life with the help of the Holy Spirit. Can I say that again? The Holy Spirit is not your do life for you. You do life with the help and the support of the Holy Spirit. You have to live this life, not the Holy Spirit, right? You have to choose to live in a disciplined manner and then take the steps to actually do so. The Holy Spirit partners with us to help us continually walk this out. But He doesn't live holy for us. We're called to be holy for as God is holy, but the Holy Spirit does not live holy for you. You have to live holy with the help and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. All right? I want to make sure we understand that because we put too much weight on the Holy Spirit. Therefore, no matter what your flesh and desires and carnal nature tells you, the true way to be happy, fortunate, in a position of favor is to obey the Word of God through how you live your life. Not pleasing your flesh. I'm going to say that again. Therefore, no matter what your flesh and desires and carnal nature tells you, the true way to be happy, fortunate, in a position of favor, and that can be summed up in the word blessed, is to obey the word of God through how you live your life. If you're really obeying the word of God, we'll see the fruit of it. You'll see the fruit of my obedience to the word of God. This is not any mystical thing that you can be obedient to God and people can't really see that you're obedient to God. No, there is fruit, visible attributes and traits that, are, that come along with being obedient to God, right? It, it produces fruit. Jesus said you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. Let's go to this scripture. Titus chapter 1 verse 6. That's one of those scriptures people probably don't even know where that is. <laughs> people don't be reading Titus. They need to though. It's one of the pastoral letters that Paul wrote. Titus chapter 1 verse 16. Says, they profess to know God. 
but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Again, Titus 1.16 says, They profess to know God, meaning speaking from their mouth, but they deny him by their works, their actions, their behavior, their character. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Titus is telling his audience that when their works or lifestyle is detestable and disobedient, they are not fit to do anything in the kingdom of God. And it's the same thing for us. When your works or lifestyle is detestable and disobedient, by reason of scripture, you are not fit to do anything in the kingdom of God. Titus was talking about, now I want to give us some context. Titus was talking about traditional legalistic law keeping Jews. Jews, that's who he was talking to. Right? And how they seem up to par spiritually when they speak. But their works and their lifestyle betrays them because it communicates something different than what they speak out of their mouth. That's who Titus was talking to. Legal, traditional legalistic law keeping Jews. Okay? Although Titus had a specific audience, which is who I just told you, this message and warning is clearly for the present day as well. Our profession of faith in God must be undergirded by works that authenticate that profession. Meaning there has to be some continuity, some synergy between our profession of faith and the things we do, our actions, our behavior, and our character. Matthew 5.16, this is a familiar passage, get this in your notes, Matthew 5.16. It says, let your light so shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father which is in heaven. This shining light is connected to our behavior, our deeds, and our actions, not our lip service and mere talk. If we belong to Christ, we have to prove this sonship to the dark world through our righteous living. You prove your sonship that you belong to Christ to this dark world through your righteous living. I'm going to say that again. When it says, let your light so shine, right? Again, this shining light is connected to our behavior, our deeds and actions, not lip service and mere talk. If we belong to Christ, we prove our sonship that we belong to Christ again through our righteous living. Type that in the comments. Righteous living. Righteous living. And then I ask the question, how else will people know that we belong to Christ? If we're not living in a righteous manner, living in a way that... Uh, indicates who our father is, how are people going to really know that we belong to Christ? Again, I'm going to default back to what Jesus says. You'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. Everyone who may be struggling to live in a righteous manner, hear this, and in a way that brings God glory, must ask themselves, why am I struggling? Who is causing me to struggle? What is causing me to struggle? Why am I allowing this who and what to cause me to struggle? What inside of me enjoys this struggling? Oh, that's the one we don't want to ask right there. What inside of me enjoys what I'm in? Right? We don't want to ask that. We act like we the victim. No, we be enjoying some of what we in. That's why we can't get delivered a lot of times. Because you can't be delivered from something that you enjoy, right? It has to be sooner they become a repulsion, right? Or else you're never going to give it up. Uh, you know, that's just, that just logically follows. Another question to ask yourself. What inside of me... Uh, no, I already asked that. What inside of me is attracted to unrighteous living? People don't want to be open and honest with themselves. And such is why people can't overcome. Again, remember, I like to ask questions because it causes us to reflect and ponder upon. Whatever has, you, has a hold on you, 
uh, it, it's not letting you get to that next level and your spiritual life is keeping you in a victim mentality or it's keeping you confined to problems that you can't seem to unravel from, you need to ask yourself why. Ask yourself why and who. Why am I allowing the who and what to do what it does, right? And sometimes it's not an outer thing. Sometimes it's you. You are the reason you can't overcome. You're the reason you can't get delivered, right? I told one person, I said, now listen, I said, you got some problems. I said, now you done told me several times you don't need to see a therapist. I said, but you seem incapable of handling your own problems. I said, so uh, if you don't need no therapist to help you walk this path, then you need to figure out how to do it yourself. I said, but I think you should get one. And I don't know if they did or not, you know, I pray that they did. Uh, but this sometimes can be a bullheaded person, you know. That they got it all control, but then life has a way of teaching people you don't got nothing under control, right? You don't got nothing in control. Now, let's see. When it comes to a lifestyle of obedience, the last question I want us to ask ourselves is, does the way I live my life make the cause of Christ appealing to others? I'm going to ask that again. Does the way I live my life make the cause of Christ appealing? When people look at your life, it, it, does Christ become appealing to them? That's something we want to ask us. It's very important. Or does the way I live my life make the cause of Christ look repulsive to others? It's one or the other. You can't be lukewarm or between, or in between, or straddling the fence. Choose ye this day who you will serve, God or your flesh. But like Brother Joshua says in the Old Testament, he says, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And if you're going to serve the Lord, this requires obedience. Obedience, as it says in the book of 1 Samuel, is better than sacrifice. God wants your obedience. It's your obedience. And Prophetess Mandy said a few weeks back that obedience is God's love language. You're giving. When, when, you, when you try to pacify God, when you've been disobedient in key areas that God has uh, called you to do something or to stop doing something and you continue to do it, whatever it is, all right, uh, we try to pacify God by thinking he's going to overlook it because we gave some tithes and offering. Because we lift our hands in worship. Our giving and our worship becomes repulsive in the face of disobedience. When your lifestyle, your life trend says disobedience, anything you do becomes a repulsion in God's nostrils. It becomes a stench. You get what I'm saying? This is how much he values obedience. Let me help us out and end this on a, a high note. There's safety in obedience. There's safety in obeying God. There's safety in obeying his word. There's safety in obeying his will. Again, one of my favorite scriptures, and we'll end it right here. Proverbs 3, 6. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. All right? So listen, you I pray that something from this uh, lesson, you know, I like to teach simple because I want people to be able to uh, take these principles and actually have a good chance at applying it in their life. But I pray that you got something from this uh, message on tonight about a lifestyle of obedience. All right? And those that are watching on Facebook, if you tuned in late uh, after this live ends, about five minutes after, then you can always come back and watch it from the beginning. We gave a lot of scriptures because I believe in speaking what the Word of God says and just teaching in a way where uh, we understand it's possible to live out the Word of God. But guess what? You're not left alone to do this. You have to just make the decision that you want to live according to the word of God. But the Holy Spirit is your partner, is your help. He is the paraclete, the one that comes alongside and assists you and undergird you so that you can walk this out. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy on today. We thank you for the word that went forth. We ask that you forgive us for all sorts and all levels of disobedience, God, that we've exercised, that we've even enjoyed. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we ask that you forgive us. Us, God, whether it be disobedience in our spiritual life, through our money and how we manage our family, our finances, whatever the case is, whatever level the disobedience has hit our life and that we allowed it to run rampant, we ask that you forgive us and that you wash us clean, God. 
In the name of Jesus, help us to lean not to our own understanding. But you said there's safety in acknowledging you, leaning to your understanding, God. So, Father, I pray that the word that has went forth, the scriptures that you gave us on tonight, God, that it has fallen on good ground and good soil and it's going to produce fruit in the lives of everyone that heard the word and that's going to be committed to living out and doing the word. So, Father, we just tell you thank you and we praise you. We be so careful to give your name the glory, the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I always like to do a call to salvation. It's very important. I'm going to always do this um, because you never want to just assume uh, where people are in their relationship with Christ. So if you, those that are watching on Facebook, those that are even here on Zoom, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, or you do, and you're just in need of a rededication, listen, the Bible again says in 1 John 1, 9, just confess your sins. Don't, don't say you have no sin. Don't act like sin isn't there. Confess it. And he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from that unrighteousness. Romans 10, 9 and 10 simply tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we could be saved. The Apostle Paul wrote that note. So now all of this is as simple as genuinely and sincerely saying, and you can repeat after me if you will. Lord, I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness. And cleansing power. I believe you are Lord. And I believe you were raised from the dead. By the power of God. So that I can be raised. From a lifestyle of sin. By the same power. I receive you into my life. By faith. And I allow you to be Lord. Over my life. In Jesus name. Amen. If you've made Christ your Lord and personal Savior for the first time. Or you've even rededicated your life. Listen we want to be of assistance to you. To help you along. In your next steps in your walk with Christ. And how to stay committed. Listen send us an email. To houseoflovefl at yahoo.com That's houseoflovefl at yahoo.com so again that we can come alongside of you those that have made Jesus your Lord and personal Savior for the first time and again those that simply rededicated your life to him listen you all we have Bible study here on Zoom, which is our primary audience, Facebook family, thank you for tuning in. But if you want the full experience, please join us on Zoom on Tuesdays at 7:15 p.m. for our Bible study, our community Bible study. Everybody is welcome. Uh, we may not always go live on Facebook. That's why I said if you want the full experience, then send us an email and we'll give you the link and the password uh, for the Zoom. Uh, but we're here on Tuesdays at 7.15. Uh, we have our Friday teaching and prayer, all right, at 5 a.m. 5 a.m. I know it's very early, uh, but we would love for all of you all to join us. And then on Sundays, we're back here on Zoom as well. And we also tune in at times uh, for the Word of God on Facebook. But again, Facebook, we would invite you to join us on Zoom. But on Sundays at 11.15 is our hour of power. I take a little bit more time uh, to teach and preach and things like that on Bible study night. Uh, but we try to just be mindful on Sundays not to keep you long. But Tuesdays, we keep you a long time, all right? So listen, you all, uh, for those that are tuning in on Facebook, we would love for you to sow a $25 seed. Click on the link in the bio, those that are here on Zoom. Uh, we pray that God moves upon your heart that you will uh, seek to sow a $25 seed. You all should know the ways to give. For those that are on Facebook watching, just click on the link in the caption of the video. Uh, just exit out the video and click on the link. It will send you to our website and it will tell you the ways to give. You can give through Cash App. You can give through PayPal. You can give through Zelle. And even tells you where you can send your uh, personal or your business checks. Uh, to be a blessing to us. As I always say, God does not need your money, but House of Love and Pastor Johnson does so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do. And I will never shy away from what giving can do. Listen, I have a, a, a great testimony, listen, uh, that I believe. If you keep seed in the ground, and not just always money, but just but when you keep seed in the ground in general, but in this case we'll talk about money, but this also includes your attitude, your actions, your behavior, uh, your help, your assistance, and all that. When you keep seeding the ground, you can always expect 
a harvest. But I want to tell you all, uh, giving up that money is the hardest thing for some people to do, right? Uh, but God honors faithful and responsible and diligent giving. And just a few testimonies, uh, my student loans, uh, that has been canceled, $50,735.40 of that. Uh, I no longer have a car note. That was $17,000. Uh, that was paid off. Uh, no longer have credit card debt. Uh, that totaled about $8,000 plus. Dollars. That has been paid off. So I have no credit card debt, no student loans. I have no car note. All right. So we got one more thing that I'm working on that I'm believing that God is going to honor one of these seeds that I've sown at some point, And he's going to cancel this last thing. Right. So that I can be 100 percent debt free. I'm 85 percent there, but I want to be 100 percent debt free. But that is what giving do does. God responds to faithful giving. You may not need God to intervene. Hear this. You may not need God to intervene for you the way that I needed him to intervene. But he knows how to respond to your giving in the way that you need it. All right. So listen, you all go again. Go ahead and sow your seed. I love you all. Facebook family, we love you. We hope that you can join us here on Zoom for the full experience. And we will see you on, uh, if you want to join us on Friday for our 5 a.m. prayer. Again, send us an email to houseoflovefl at yahoo.com. And uh, we will definitely give you the link and the password uh, so that you can join us. So Facebook family, we love you. Until next time, God bless.